All right, welcome. Welcome. Phil, you know we do this in the intro, right? Like the intro music. You um, already interrupt me. No recollection. You want to keep interrupting me in the actual Just intro saying too. hi to all of our fans. Welcome, bottom of the bill fans. You got a very special treat for you today. If you've ever gone to Halloween, Swanee Rising, Bear Creek, uh, Paul Levine is the guy you have to thank for that. And he's our guest today. Kind of like the, I would say, I don't know, like one of the father of the fathers of the jam scene in Jacksonville. I yeah, mean, without a doubt. One of the, I mean, not just Jacksonville, all of the Southeast, I would say. He's a gem. Yeah. Without him, like none of these big name acts would have even touched Florida. Like it's in the middle of like no tour. Yeah. But they all flock down to Swanee and it's the coolest spot in the world. You know them. Yeah. You you know them. Uh, you finally get asked them all the questions. Yeah. Plenty of great questions. If you if you're into if you're trying to produce festivals or get into that side of it, he talks a lot about that. Uh, more importantly for us, if your band's trying to figure out how to do this kind of stuff, he gives you a lot of great insight on how to you know approach going about things, uh, speaking to promoters and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, so it was a great episode for us. I thought it was a really good one. It was awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, check it out. We hope you enjoy. Yeah, Bottom of the Bill starts now. Oh, also merchandise. No, wait, hang on. It doesn't start yes, <laughs> yet, but hang on. Mer merchandise in the link below, Bottom of the Bill merch. I keep forgetting to mention that every single intro. Uh, so check that out. Buy some Bottom of the Bill merch and enjoy the episode. Is it starting now? It's starting now. It's starting now. This is Bottom of the of the bill where we talk about the modern grind of a musician album cycle oh, hold on bill give me a second man because we don't know what we're talking Spotify about Spotify playlist you keep interrupting me that's not how we discussed it just give me a second man we invite established artists festival on festival lineups can I just get my stuff out real quick we invite established artists on to share their strategy to success marketing strategy the premier do it yourself podcast hashtag D Ah, screw it. This is the bottom of the bill. All right. Well, uh, welcome, bottom of the bill fans. This week we got Paul Levine on the show. Thanks for being here, man. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to to sit here and hang with us in the podcast. My pleasure. I love the outdoor setting, man. You look great, like outside, just like a power move. Like, yeah, I do podcasts outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, inside I've I've got a three animals, a son, and and uh, more mayhem than uh, than out here. And it it's uh, you know out here it sounds like a bird sanctuary. So it, it kind of I thought I'd bring a kind of that peaceful element to your show. Yeah, that's no, great. And yes. then when nobody talks, we can hear crickets, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, man. Well, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. I'm, I'm curious, uh, for those who don't know, Paul Levine uh, produces festivals like Halloween, Swanee Rising, um, and uh, used to be Bear Creek as well. Uh, what what uh, what kind of prompted you, you to get into that side of the industry? Or what, what kind of role did music play in your upbringing to make you want to pursue that? Um, well, uh, I mean, of course I always loved music. Um, my grandmother was a composer, but, um, she wrote, uh, classical music and popular music, I guess back in the forties, maybe thirties and forties. Um, really? but that really had nothing to do with, you know, I mean that, I guess that, um, turned me on to music somehow but didn't really influence the style of music that i would go on to listen to my parents loved music um i went to boarding school um and started smoking pot um and listening to santana and uh, credence clearwater revival and you know the beatles and um jethro tull and traffic and um a lot of stuff like that. I love Eric Clapton. I remember seeing Clapton and, and Tom Petty in the, back in the eighties in high school. Um, and, and then I, you know, towards the end of high school, I started listening to Grateful Dead. Um, once I got to college, I started going to see a lot of dead shows. Um, I was going to Lehigh university at the time. And I tried to, at that point, 
I was so into it. I tried to figure out how to get the Grateful Dead to come play at Lehigh University. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> it, I had I had pages of notes on what to do, but you know, we never nothing happened. But what I did do was um, I was able to convince a few of the fraternities to um, put up a little bit of money to help organize uh, what we called farmhouse parties, um, which ended up being small music festivals on a really nice piece of land near the college that people came in, um, watched music and did a did an ex- obscene amount of drinking and partying. Um, uh, and, you know, I, from then on, I, I kind of had the bug. Um, I, I moved to Colorado to Aspen, um, in the winter of 92, 93 to go skiing. I thought that sounded like a good idea. Um, and ended up staying there for eight years. And, um, while I was there, uh, I worked in restaurants, but then I met some young people, um, a couple other young folks, and we opened up a little cafe um, called The Howling Wolf uh, in Aspen. And um, we it was a restaurant, coffee house, bar, kind of art gallery. It's kind of a Greenwich village kind of kind of hip place. And we started having music. Um, and as that progressed, I became more... Um, you know, enamored with the music side of things. I love the restaurant business. I, you know, attributed to me making an income for a lot of my earlier years um, as I tried to establish myself in the music industry. I didn't necessarily know that I was going into the music and, you know, it just kind of organically happened through the the restaurant business. Um, And then eventually out there, we started a festival in Aspen, called the Aspen Harmony Festival. And, um, you know, uh, that was in the late 90s. And back then I was, you know, I was working with String Cheese Incident and Leftover Salmon. And, you know, we did a festival with Black Crows and with Widespread Panic and Carl Denson's Tiny Universe and, you know, the Tragically Hip. Uh, um, you know, in peace, Gord Downey. Uh, um, you know, bands like that. We had, we had Fastball. I don't know if you remember Fastball. I heard the name sounds very familiar. No, sorry. No. They, they had that song called The Way. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And uh, they were on it. You know, Strings, she's like, we're much bigger in Colorado. And we were like, well, they're, they're the number two radio hit in the country. And uh, so Strings, she's had to open up for Fastball and, Oh, I think man. we have a lot, we laugh about it still, but <laughs> um, uh, but that's how things got started, and um, you know, and eventually my path led to led to Florida. Um, I'm curious, did you have like any mentors early on that they were kind of coaching you through, or like giving you insight into how to produce festivals and book bands and that kind of thing? One of the you know regrets I have is that. And it's not really a regret, but um, not so much. Um, you know, I was, you know, at that time when I, we started the Howling Wolf, I would have to say I probably wasn't ready to own a restaurant and music venue, at least emotionally and business-wise. Um, don't get me wrong, the Howling Wolf was the greatest experience of my life. Um, but, uh, we were young and we enjoyed the heck out of it. Um, so there was a little bit too much partying, a little, you know, but, but also lack of business sense at that point. I hadn't developed it. We, you know, we were, we didn't understand, um, when we opened up, we we had some debt and we didn't understand how to deal with debt. You know, we thought, Oh, you open up, you sell things, you take the money and you pay the people you owe. Well, if you do that, well, then at the end of the month, you don't have enough money to pay the tax guy. Right. You know? So you have to you have to pay things back 
incrementally and you, you learn how to, you know, as you get older. So, um, but I mean, it was an amazing place. Um, you know, I, um, my partner and I, I met him, I picked him up hitchhiking. We went back to our, my place in Aspen. We got high and decided that day we were, we were going to be business partners. Um, a duty and we wrote right a business plan that day. <laughs> uh, and, um, kept going. Um, we decided we wanted to have a place that Hunter Thompson would like. Um, well, that's right. Cause he, he was running it. for mayor then, wasn't he? Huh? He was running for mayor then in Aspen, right? He ran for sheriff in 1970 sheriff. and I was, was wasn't there quite that oh, okay. My bad. early, yeah. <laughs> but, but he still lived there. Um, and, um, you know, we had the hummus S Thompson on the menu and, nice. um, <laughs> You know, so one thing to let and that led to the next. He ended up liking the place, and we became friends, and we got in, we worked on political campaigns together, and um, you know, it was you know one of the great you know um, things in my life that I got, got to be friends with him and the people around him. He you know he had really interesting friends, and um, was always surrounded by interesting people and experience. Experiences, um, uh, but but you know, so in terms of mentors, not so much. Um, there was a lot of learning by uh, you know by doing, um, which is a great way to learn things, but sometimes is expensive. Um, you know, the mistakes you make um, in a restaurant and in the music business can really cost you, um, and. You know, so if I could go back and and do it again, that place would still be here. It was became it was an Aspen institution for a number of years. You know, we were written up in the New York Times and all sorts of places all over the world as the hip place in town. You know, and, um, did Hunter but, S. Thompson ever give you advice? <laughs> Anything that he told you to do? <laughs> um, well. When things started going badly, I asked him if he wanted to be our partner. And I, oh. <laughs> um, but uh, advice, I remember when things were going bad and I felt like, you know, you had, you know, we, we were closing and we were having financial problems. And I felt like there were a lot of people that were, I don't know. I felt like people had turned on me or something like that. You know, I was young and I was not, you know, and he's, you know, he kind of is like, well, you know, Paul, you know, <laughs> it's kind of how it is, you know, just, you know, welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, you know, he had a great way of putting things in perspective. Did you become uh, your partner? <laughs> no, there's no way. No, he, he was sensible enough to know that, you know, that that wasn't, you know, uh, the best place for him to invest his money. Right. I don't think uh, that adjective has ever been used for Hunter S. Thompson. Sensible. Sensible, yeah. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. That's a pretty awesome story, man. Yeah. Um, I'm curious uh, to people that are just kind of like wanting to get involved in, on the production side of a festival. Um, what are some things, you know, just kind of starting out, you got no name, no contacts, no understanding of how the business works. You know, how do you, how do you pull together funds? Like what, what's, what are the first steps that someone would take? Well, um, when you're younger, you think you can do things without funds. Uh, and that's sometimes how you can get into some trouble because, you know, because everybody goes into that kind of stuff with good intentions, right? We're going to put on the greatest thing in the world. It's going to make people happy. Of course, the money is just going to make sense at the end, right? All right. <laughs> uh, particularly nowadays, it's even worse. Like to have that kind of an attitude today is – incredibly reckless with the way thing, what everything costs, at least when I got started, you know, gas was under a dollar, you know, uh, and it just hotels were cheap. Everything, you know, right. Running stuff was cheap. 
not like it is today, but um, I guess, you know, the key is to, when you're getting started, um, is to find a, a venue, you know, they don't grow on trees. Um, you need to find a place that makes sense to, to have events that you like, that you think people will, will like, but that you can, that are, that actually have proper permitting. You know, one of the biggest problems a lot of people have when they get into it is they don't understand the permitting process and what it takes. You know, it's a lot of people when they start just try to put on an event and then halfway through they realize they need a permit from the county, you know, or, right. You know, <laughs> um, and, uh, so that gets some people into trouble, but, you know, prop, you know, making sure you have a proper finance, pro- proper financing, um, a, a good venue, um, that supports what you're doing. Um, and having some people around you that, that do have some experience. It's a really, it's, it's a, it's a huge thing to, to, to bite off, um, putting on a music festival. There's so many facets to that, you know, you know, not just booking bands or hiring staff or marketing, but keeping people safe. Right. You know, um, you know, making, you know, making sure that the trucks can get in and out of the venue properly. Um, uh, you know, that emergency services should something happen, can get there and can get to people safely if it's a camping event, you know? So, um, when I started doing music festivals outside of Colorado, um, I, I, I started working at other music festivals. Um, and that was very eye opening. Um, you know, just working on crews, um, worked on security crew, uh, 10,000 lakes festival. I worked at this festival in, called smile fest, in North Carolina, on ops crews and, production crews and, and learned a lot about what was going on there then. Um, and so when I got to, and, and I started doing that when I was in Florida. Um, uh, and so that was very helpful in getting um, things started in Florida. Uh, and the first thing we did in Florida was called Down on the Farm, which was in Quincy, Florida, outside of Tallahassee. Um, we did that for three years. And after that went away, um, the following year we started Bear Creek. Um, <laughs> talking about permitting, Bear Creek was originally supposed to be at a farm in Quincy, Florida. My partner, Lyle Williams, bought 400 acres um, in Quincy, Florida to have down on, the, to move down on the farm, but start Bear Creek. And then actually there's a creek in Quincy, Florida called Bear Creek. No one ever asked me why is there a festival called Bear Creek at Suwannee, and it was always weird that no one ever asked. But there's nothing called Bear Creek anywhere near there. Uh, it's the Bear Creek's actually in Quincy. Um, but what happened was is that we'd had the go ahead to do the event at that property, but a month out, the Board of County Commissioners did not issue the permit, oh, and fuck. so a month before the show, we had to move to the Suwannee. And if it weren't, wasn't for the kindness of James Cornett, the owner of Spirit of the Swanee, um, never would have been a Bear Creek. But we did it, and and then that started the Suwannee chapter, you know, of my of my life. Um, That's amazing. You know, a month out, they 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 didn't approve the permit, and they get to like just logistically, <laughs> you have to get all those those ducks in a row to like move the venue, and like just that must have been such a nightmare. It was, but it was a blessing in disguise, um, you know, and the good news there was, I mean, I'd been to the park from MAGFest, I think, maybe the one, first Wani. Um, you know, they, the infrastructure at the park made, made that transition easier than it would to, say, another farm. They had to bring in all the production, the generator stages, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right, so, right. Now I'm curious as as some of the, the the festivals that you have produced like early on uh, to you know the stuff that you're kind of doing now what, are are there like things that you um, that kind of obviously like things change as the festival scales and gets larger some things that work 
um, on a smaller level might not work on a bigger level or translate the same kind of way. Um, are there like, what kind of things were you noticing that you were doing for the smaller festivals that maybe didn't work so well in the bigger festivals or vice versa? Yeah, it's more vice versa. Um, when I started, when we started Bear Creek, um, we had five stages, but we had like 2,500 people, right? right? You know, um, but in creatively, um, you know, we kind of the, the the events that that I we felt that Bear Creek um, shouldn't e- not emulate, but it, it, Bear Creek came out of the ethos of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival and all late night music that they have there. It 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 a lot of people compared Bear Creek to Jam Cruise, um, you know, and so between Jam Cruise, Bear Creek, and Jazz Fest, that was kind of the funk triumvirate um well if you've been to a jam cruise or you've been to jazz fest there's oh there's tons of music all the time in different stages and different bars and so part of the greatness is the blur of music and so we brought came to bear creek creatively trying to create this utopia of music just having non-stop amazing live music in people's face you know on different stages and so that people would have to run from place to place to and you know um you know and i still believe this to be true especially for bigger festivals sometimes the how you judge a festival festival's greatness is by what you missed you know Um, (laughs) interesting yeah um and so we had to, we just had too many stages and, you know, it, those, every stage costs money, you know, the, the production team, the sound equipment, the bands. And so, um, a lesson I learned as I've, so as I've gone further in my career is to start, start smaller and build to, to that point, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's, you know, I, I've seen other promoters come to Swanee and make the same mistake. It's just starting too big, too fast. There's no sense in doing that. Um, even though you want creatively to express yourself in a certain way. I always thought that was so cool about Bear Creek, though, because like every year it kept on getting bigger and bigger and had like, you know, by the end of it, it had Bootsy Collins playing. And I was just like, this can't get any funkier. You know what I mean? Uh, the second thing that I was going to say about uh, uh, the way that it is at Jazz Fest in New Orleans, about going back and forth as like a blur, that was my favorite part. And I think most people that were at Bear Creek was going back and forth between the amphitheater and the uh, the porch stage uh, like that. That just that that trek that you did, like it also was like freezing cold out, but like it was just like you felt like you were like in a group of or herd of cows or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That was the best, and and it was like a, at the second that uh, uh, the stage was do- done at the amphitheater, the port stage started. It was just a wonderful like dopamine rush every single time a sh- show was ending because you're like well, that's where we're going next, and you're just right across the street. It was great, man. We, I mean. I think, you know, Bear Creek will always be my favorite um, show that, that I've ever done. Um, I love all the other shows. I love Purple Hatters, but I love Halloween. I think Halloween's the greatest, um, the most, uh, you know, pound for pound for just pure entertainment. It's almost impossible to beat that show. But musically and creatively, Bear Creek really was in my heart, um, everything about it. Uh, um, so I, I agree with you, the, you know, the excitement of going from stage to stage. And I think Bear Creek was like, like now the festival industry has matured back when Bear Creek was going, there was, there wasn't thousands of music festivals. There were music festivals, but there weren't tons of music festivals like there are now or they were like and the real so, big ones like bonnaroo you know what i mean that were like you're gonna miss everything <laughs> if you show up to bonnaroo so i don't know yeah so you know bear creek there was still a naivete about the audience and about us and like a, a, a youthfulness and kind of 
I don't know. There's just an energy, you know, the, the bands were young. Lettuce was young. Yeah. Um, Dumpster Funk was young. I know. <laughs> you know so the nice. Master Sounds were young. Like, um, so it was, you know, it was kind of just a special time, I think, where a lot of great things kind of came together at that place. And the people that came there were just the greatest, you know, and, and it's a lot of the same people that come to the, all the shows at the park. Um, you know, just the greatest, most loving, open-minded music fans, you know, that with a tight, you know, that were just open to everything. That was the thing about Bear Creek is that people were just ready for whatever was going to hit them. And that made it so special. Um, and I think a lot of people were able to, you know, start relationships with bands that continue to be their favorite bands today. Um, you know, and that was really cool. Totally. I've, I have noticed over the last uh, five years or so, maybe, maybe even more, that like the the festival kind of template has been uh, kind of uh, being implemented even on the on the on across the pop markets now. Do you think that there's uh, that that they kind of saw what was happening on the ground level, like the, the, the jam band scene, that kind of stuff, and we're like, this is a model that's working? Or do you think that there's something kind of started happening? where headlining acts were getting too expensive at that level. It just made more sense to maybe do a festival and kind of, you know, I don't know if, if it makes it cheaper to hire fed headliners for a festival rather than doing like a head, like, you know, one-off show or whatever. But I'm just curious as to why you think the pop market started, started adopting the template. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I just think that, you know, Bonnaroo did have a lot to do with it. Um, and, you know, if you remember the first Bonnaroo, it was, it was a jam band festival. Right. Um, and um, I think I think a lot of business people and people in the different and more popular scenes noticed the marketing potential at music festivals. Um, you know... At a, at a good music festival, you have a very captive audience and you really can market to them and create serious brand loyalty, um, you know, for the brands that are out there. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's uh, Maeve, come here. Come here. Um, and so I think that really contributed to it and sponsors started seeing that. Um, and so money started following, you know, um, early on, you know, you could go to music festivals for 75 bucks, a hundred bucks. So, you know, those days are mostly behind us. Um, and so I think people started seeing the real financial potential um, in them, uh, truth be told is, you know, a lot of music festivals lose money, <laughs> you know, yeah. way more than you think, um, more than make money, I think. And, you know, and unfortunately today, a lot of them are subsidized by bigger companies. So they, so losses are acceptable because they're trying to sell product. Mm. You know, they're trying to create brand loyalties and and things like that to sell other stuff. So you know, the festivals so. are more like a long-term marketing investment than like an actual way to make income off of it type thing. I, I absolutely there's some of that, particularly with the more mainstream events. Wow, that's why I want to know about uh, the Sacred Rose Festival because the tickets for that, in comparison to a lot of the other festivals, are so cheap. But the 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 lineup is insane that they have, you know. And I'm just like, are, are you just planning on just just you know, never having this festival again. I don't know how it's supposed to go off. Yeah, I remember that one that was announced. Yeah, yeah, it's it's still next month. Yeah. Well, yeah, Sacred Rose. My uh, my partner, well, former partner, but partner for life, uh, Michael Berg, is the talent buyer for Sacred Rose and for with me at Halloween. Um, and why? What are they charging for that? I think I saw something like $125 for three days. And I'm just, but if you, the, and I, I'm not, I'm not sure how much the, uh, or what the headline, I'm sorry, the, um, the, 
lineup looks like, but just like every single giant jam band act you can think of is playing there like twice. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. But it's in a it's like in a soccer stadium in Chicago, yeah. outside of Chicago. Yeah, I mean it's gonna be fun. No, I know. I mean, you know, they have it's a big market up there, so they have a bigger audience, you know. They can they can draw more people. And that's what and, I'm thinking too, is like they're they're charging that low so that more people will show up. Or yeah, something. if you have a you know, fifty thousand cap Oof. venue or something, then you can charge a little bit less money that's for a for a ticket if you're gonna make it up on the volume side of it. Yeah, just as a fact check, a three day general admission oh. is one forty five. One forty five. I was close, but like when they were first selling it, it was like that cheap. It was like one twenty five was super cheap. But Props to Michael Berg and uh, Sacred Rose people for bringing affordable music to the people. Yeah, for that's real, what I was, like, I, like when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, we gotta go. Like I was like looking at how much it was gonna cost to do all this, and like I still can't afford it because it's all the way in Chicago. But at the same time, like, damn, I would love for festivals <laughs> always at that sticker price. You know yeah, I mean? totally. But so, totally. Whatever. I'm, I'm, I am curious, you, you're mentioning how some of the festivals now are kind of subsidized by bigger companies. Um, and this it's kind of a, you know, off of that topic where uh, when you're talking about like investors and sponsors and like, like to, to raise money for festivals, you know, obviously there's a, there's a bit of a difference between what an investor has at stake in, in, a, in, in their investment versus what a sponsor has at stake. Can you maybe describe some of the differences there and and uh, you know how you might pitch an investor versus sponsor when getting into you know buying into the, the vision. Well, I mean, an investor, you know, um, a sponsor is not jumping on unless you, you know, you have a track record, right? Large, or you can say, well, we're doing this, and this is who we're going to book, and we're going to spend this much on talent. And this is, you know, sometimes sponsors will, will buy that and say, okay, you book this and you're going to do this. Okay. We'd like to get in, but you know, the first year of most events is, is the toughest year to bring in sponsors. Um, in terms of investors, well, you know, look, there's a, you know, a lot of people would love to be in the, in the music festival business. Um, a lot of people think they can put on music festivals. Um, so finding, finding investors is, is more, you know, you're looking for somebody who's, um, who's interested in being in the music business. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's their quickest way in, but, um, you know, they, you know, you hope that and then your investor can contribute more than money. Um, but sometimes that, that that's how it is, and that's their arrangement. You know, some investors, well, they contribute money and and they get to be a part of it, and some of them they just want to hang out backstage. <laughs> right, <laughs> just want to live the life. Did um, I lost you guys? Oh, you lost us. Yeah, we're we're still recording everything like that. Just one of the cameras overheated. So, oh. Oh. yeah. Um, so. You know, you, you, the first first step is to have investors, and then and then you move on to the sponsors, right? Right, right. Yeah. So, um, uh, and then the, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask, kind of on the uh, festival side of it or the production side of it, anyways, is uh, like the uh, the customer experience, basically. Like obviously, you know, taking care of bands and getting all the stuff on the back end worked out is important, but nothing really happens without the customer. So how, how important is uh, their experience in figuring out like the layout of the festival and like the, you know, whatever kind of extras, like hula with all the lighting and, and the events that happen, you know, in between, like all that stuff are huge selling points for people that might, might not even be into the music itself, you know? I, um, I've always brought a restaurant business um, mentality to the music festivals. Um, it, cause I've honestly, I think they're in a lot of ways, the same thing. Um, a restaurant, you know, like the one we had at least is, you know, you're inviting it, it all really, it all started in people's kitchen. It's like, you're inviting people into your house. You're taking, you're giving them an experience, you know, you want to give them the best experience they can have hopefully to forget their worries for a little while, um, and you know, to make them feel special. Um, 
and it's which is kind of similar to music festivals. You know, it's your house that they're coming to, and you have to provide everything that they need for to have the best experience possible. And what I've always done is, um, even with Halloween, I still answer the info at Suwanee Halloween emails. Um, you know, I don't want anyone else to do it. I want to know what what people are thinking. I'm still on the Facebook groups and I still answer that stuff and I pay attention to the Reddit and, you know, listening, sometimes people's gripes are seemingly ridiculous, but more often not than not, you can, you can learn something when somebody complains. Um, uh, even if even if they don't have a legitimate complaint, there might be some element of truth to it. And so paying attention and having being really and of course being out there with people, walking around, you know, observing totally yeah. in the stages, you know, and seeing how things translate for your guests is is crucial. And so I like to think that the shows that we that we've done everywhere but very certainly at the park that we pay we pay particular attention to our guests desires what they want what they don't what they don't think went well um you know from year to year we make changes and with the intention of improving the show you, you know you never have a perfect show um and it can always be better and you can always learn from you know you learn from the people that come where you're fucking up. <laughs> right. Part of my language. No. <laughs> no, that's true though, for sure, man. I, I've, uh, whenever I've been to any of the Swanee festivals, it's, uh, the Halloween, uh, uh, kind of lighting exhibits and stuff have always just blown me away. You don't really see that a lot of it other. It was ridiculous last year. Uh, I didn't, I missed it last yeah, year. It was but, insane. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's really a cool, unique, I think, element that really enhances the experience. Again, there's, there's a lot of people that, that go to those festivals because they're tagging along. You know, maybe, maybe they're not super into it or their friends are, are into it. They're just kind of hanging out. Um, and uh, it, just, it just adds a, like a, a totally different element that I think gets a lot more people on board with going and then, and then ultimately exposing them to a bunch of new up-and-coming bands and, or some other established bands and scenes they, they weren't familiar with, you know? Yeah, yeah, a, a thousand percent. There's a lot of people that just you know they don't care what the lineup is because they know it's going to be awesome exactly you know it's you know you know every year there's always um you know oh i can't believe you got this band <laughs> what, you, what you didn't get tame impala you didn't get <laughs> you know Odessa used to be bass nectar yeah <laughs> i was about to say it's got to be about bass nectar. like why are you booking bass nectar yeah for sure that's yeah, everybody's yeah. like jam band, uh, right? You know, so there's always, you know, not everyone's going to love it, the, particularly with Hula, like the, the headliners are great, but really to me, Hula is about everything else. Cause, the, cause the, you know, just, we would like to pack it full of amazing live bands. Of right. And, and we, we expect that when you come to Halloween, you're going to walk out of having seen 20 new bands that you never heard of that blew your mind. You know, it was like that at Bear Creek too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah. And that's when you, you know, I was going to say uh, that well, the, I never left like spirit leg. I just kept on going back and forth between those two stages and like all the, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, the art installations that were there. That was just the coolest part about it. Yeah. Super immersive experience. Yeah. I think a lot of festivals, I mean, there's some around the country that probably have a similar thing, but I think that that concept is is not as widely adopted quite yet, you know, and I think it's a really cool, unique experience to to what you guys do over at Swanee. Yeah, you're ahead of the curve at Bear Creek and again at Halloween, man. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that it's in our backyard, too. <laughs> yeah, for real. Well, you know, it's I'm thankful that we've been able to um, to do these things and, you know, to have such a special place to do them. Uh you know, because that, like I said earlier, you know, having the right venue is, it's a huge piece of it. Yeah. You know, like with Halloween, it's like, 
Halloween is like Spirit of the Swanee plus music plus art plus the crowd is magic. Right. 100%. Plus our set, which is really, you know, customer oriented, you know, and, and all that. So oh. when all those things are clicking, you know, that's when people, you know, at, you know, at the end of the weekend, that's when you see people, you know, blissed out and, you know, just feeling no pain and just having been barraged by stimulation all weekend. It's emotional. You know, I cry at the end of good music festivals, you know, just because just because the dopamine and the serotonin and like everybody's leaving and, and this was so great and I miss it, you know, like that kind of shit, you know, like it, it's it, 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 it's emotional for people. You know, you see people in the middle of, I'm sure, I don't know, maybe you didn't see it or not, but people will be up there in Spirit Lake. They'll be bawling because they can't believe how beautiful it is. Yeah, totally. It was ridiculous. Uh, before we before we go on to the the billboard, uh, I what I've got one complaint about uh, Swanee, and I don't know if you were in charge of this at all, but what happened to the uh, the restrooms that are next to the porch stage? You got rid of the pissing troughs, and now it's all urinals everywhere. Um, <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I feel like that's gotta be a decision. <laughs> Well, you mean in the John Condo? In the what? Sorry. In the there's a building there that's yeah. called the John Condo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It used to have the troughs in it. Yeah, I know, and now it's all urinals. <laughs> it was I, it was so much it was fun. COVID. It was so much fun. I believe we? it's COVID. Yeah, it's because of COVID. Oh, COVID. No, it was before that. No, right, I, well, I was just wondering. I, I was just wondering. Every, I blame everything on COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, bring them back. I get all the boys want them back. Yeah, all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, go in the woods and, you know, shovel out like a trough. Yeah. Kind of thing. Get all pissed together in the woods. It's there like, you go. You know, be more pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that show was hilarious. I mean, I'll, 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 let, I'll let the park know. I, I, was, I wasn't in on that decision. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Just make it short. All right. Just make it short. Um, all right, so I want to move on to the uh, next segment, the bottom of the billboard segment. Uh, for those who don't know, every week we request or we review a new song, and um, then we decide whether or not it goes on to the... <laughs> oh, there they are. All right. <laughs> uh, we, and then we decide whether or not the song goes on to our bottom of the billboard playlist uh, on Spotify, and then it's usually fun because Billy and I don't agree on anything when it comes to music, so uh, it's always a fun segment. Um, so this week I chose. Uh, okay. <laughs> I chose the yeah. It's a one we played together for the last five years because it never we never agree on anything. Nope. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so the revivalist um, other side of paradise is a song that I chose this week. Um, so I uh, saw the revivalist for the <laughs> first time uh, actually the year that we played Halloween, which I think was 2018. And they were um, playing, I think it was Sunday afternoon, they were playing on the amphitheater stage. And um, I had some friends of mine that were like kind of, uh, they were super into them at the time. And uh, they were telling me to go to the set and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. And then, anyways, we ended up kind of stumbling upon their set. And it ended up being one of my favorite sets of the whole weekend because it was so polished and so well put together and just sonically everything was great. The songs were all really good. Um, so I kind of dug into their stuff and this is the first song on their last studio album they put out. And then it's the last song on their newest, uh, live album they did, which was live at Muscle Shoals. So, um, yeah, the first time I heard this song, it really just kind of hit me. I love the introduction yeah. and yeah, it's like beautiful harmonies and just like the lyrics are really great. The production's amazing on it. Like the way everything just sonically sits so nicely. Um, and then, uh, What's his name? Uh, Shaw, D David Shaw. His voice, man. He's such a, yeah, talented singer, man. Uh, and and I just I love they'll it. Be at, they'll be at Halloween. Oh, they will. Yeah, not the revivalist. David David solo band. Oh, David Shaw. Yeah, his solo album is pretty good too. Actually, I, I dug that. Um, but what do you think, Bill? So I've got I, I overall I think it was really a good song. It's very clean, like you said, like very very polished. The, I've got like two two notes about it. The first one is that. This song doesn't have an ending. 
uh, I listened to it on repeat on Spotify while I was mowing my lawn today, and I had no idea when it started over. Uh, yeah. If you if you do listen to it on repeat, it's really funny because it, it starts with a uh, thing like that, yeah. and it just doesn't have like a, a close closing. So it, it's almost like you know, have like a big finish or something like that, or fade out. I don't know. Well, yeah, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I listen to it in the context of the album, right? Because it's just yeah. it's the first song, and I get it. It's yeah. like yeah, it's a good it's a good first song, a good intro song. You know, yeah. it's not the best. I mean, David Bowie. You listen to it on the album, not on the Muscle Shoals one. Yeah, yeah. Did you listen to it on the actual album or, or the Muscle? I don't Shoals know. One? I I only listened to. It's the first song, and then that was on the on the studio album. Okay, yeah. I don't think it was a live album. Okay, yeah. If that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, that's it. And then the second one is that it's just really it's a really soft song. Yeah, you're it's not very, into that. No, that's not what I said. I I'm just saying it's just very soft. Uh, I do like this song, and I think that it makes it for me. I, that's my vote. But I just think that it's. Uh, I think that we need, yeah, we need a couple softies on the playlist. Yeah. You can't, you can't do Bon Jovi shot through the heart the entire time. Although I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> but you can't, you can't do that every time. So yeah, this is a good like slow dancing uh, eighth grade song. For okay, sure. get the fuck out of here. I'm just saying, <laughs> the revivalists have a lot of like good like bangers and everything like that. This one has got to be their soft. Is there a softer song that they have? No, I think that's probably that's got to be this one then. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I I like it. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay, what do you think, Paul? I mean, uh, I mean, David, da David it can sing some some really nice, you know, lovely sonic songs, you know, mellow, you know, heart tugging uh, kind of stuff. I, I listened to the Muscle Shoals version today. And, yeah. And and it had some of that, you know, kind of Muscle Shoals vibe to it, you know, almost almost a bit of gospel -y. Yep. Not example, exactly, but um, yeah, I think it's a really nice song. And, and uh, I, I enjoyed listening to that album. It was, you know, it's not full of bangers, It's but it's it's very pleasing, easy listening kind of music. Like if you were driving or whatever, it would be great, to, great as a soundtrack, you know, just or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I listen to like Elliot Smith all the time. So don't tell me I don't like soft songs for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So true. the revivalists had that what's that song that we cover? We used to anyways. Uh, uh Wish I Knew You. Wish I Knew You. Like that one's like a hit. That's, that's a great, great song. That's a great song. And so that's what I thought it was gonna be like when I listened to it and I was like, Oh, this is like it's quiet. Yeah. It's yeah. peaceful. Yeah, I think it's cool. It shows their 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 dynamic range, you know, and, and their ability as songwriters to kinda switch it up a little bit, you know. They've got some great pop songs that they're like really well written and dancey and the whole thing and then they can also kind of go back to the roots i think and i love how the revivalists have even though they've kind of um you know broken through to the mainstream uh, to some extent you, you really kind of still feel like that new orleans vibe with their music you know they, they kind of like never lost touch with that that's what you know i thought that was, that was really cool they came to us uh for the first time at bear creek oh really so you kind of watch the trans, like you kind of watch them kind of grow over the years. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was, it was. We were so proud of them. They're just young, you know, young boys when they got started. And you know, back then, you know, of course, you know, we had Dumpster Funk and we had George Porter and we had Galactic and we had, you know, Anders Osborne, a lot of the New Orleans legends, and uh, and they were just the young pups. You know, and they were getting shit from all the everybody else. You know, <laughs> I mean, a friend, friendly, you know, ribbing. You know, of course. And, um, and uh, you know, and just to to watch them explode. You know, and I mean, I saw them open for the Rolling Stones in Jacksonville a couple of years ago. I mean, wow, that was that was an incredible thrill. You know, just just you know, because they're salt of the earth guys. Well, anyways, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw, I saw I'm coming in hot. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the uh, kind of speaking of watching bands at that, uh, at, like kind of do that, go through that process, and kind of watching them come up. Um, what is like, kind of like? Uh, obviously, you got to deal with a lot of up and coming bands booking these festivals and stuff, and. Uh, um, you know, talking about like, like the, the, the customer experience and all that stuff when you're put, pr producing these, what about like the artist experience? What are you thinking about when it comes to taking care of artists on that side of it? And, uh, you know, there's a really, you know, we've played like really, uh, <laughs> um, you know, half put together festivals where there's really no consideration into the artist, 
experience upon arrival or anything. And it kind of makes it hard to put the show on um, or just makes it a little bit more difficult, especially being on the road all day or whatever. Um, but that was far from the experience of, you know, working with you guys at Halloween and other big festivals like that, where it's just so, it seems so easy. And like, we're just, we don't have to think about anything, you know? Well, I, I mean, to me, that's fundamental. And it also goes back to the, you know, restaurant industry mentality, um, you know, um, like what I like at the Howling Wolf and Aspen, we, we only had 70 people that can come into the club. So bands would come play there. Part of it was because we gave them good dinner, you know? Right. Um, and because we had really good food. And, you know, to me, part of why I got into it is because I revere artists, you know? Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan. And and I I very clearly understand, and and I'm not the only one, but... You know, if you want an artist to play their best show, they need to be comfortable. You know, you need to, it doesn't mean you have to give them everything. It just means you have to take care of them and take care of what they need. And, you know, yeah, sure. Some things or what what have you, but you just can't, you know, if you have an artist that, you know, comes to a music festival and, the staff doesn't know what's going on and there's no direction and, you know, and nobody knows what's, what they're doing. It feels chaotic and that can be translated into the performance, you know? So, you know, the, the least we can do, and it's the same with our staff too. It's like, there's a fit, you know, there's a deal. It's like, you're going to come here. We're going to, we're going to pay you. We're going to feed you well, and we're going to treat you well. And we expect that you're going to go and have your best performance where you're going to give us, you know, your best effort on the job because we're going to deliver for you what, what is really part of the social contract almost to me. Right. It's like you know, how it's supposed to be, you know? And so when it falls short, it's because people just, they just don't know what they're doing. Right. You, know, you have to, you have to make artists happy. You, you know, artists talk to each other. We want, artists to tell each other you know what a good job we do so that other people will want to come and people will want to come back so that's you know that's one of the most important you know things to me about putting on shows is you know is is taking care of artists because inevitably they're the ones that are you know bringing people out and taking care of the of the fans for sure for sure well, I wish everybody, every venue owner and every sound guy would just have that mentality. But I, you could obviously see it when uh, uh, you go to Swanee, especially like at uh, Bear Creek or Halloween when, when I've ever played there. They're like, just like, what do you need? Do you need anything at all? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> they are like, or like when you break down uh, your set, they're like just taking your equipment off the stage. And that never happens anywhere else yeah. where they're like, it's like, do you need me to bring your bags? I'm like, excuse me. Yes. That would be amazing. I didn't know that was part of the gig. Well, I feel a lot, a lot of that is just kind of like learned over time. Right. I mean, a lot of the festival, if we played smaller festivals or any small festivals you've played that are just like kind of not well run, it's, it's usually not because anybody's having any bad intent or ill will towards anybody. It's usually just like they're, they're completely oblivious to, to like the process of, you know, of all the different moving parts and everything that, you know, it's like one thing to take care of the customer experience, but then it's like, okay, you have all these like bands coming in. There's like logistics when it comes to parking and like catering or whatever it might be just to make sure people yeah. are, pay, are taken care of. You know, if we show up to a festival and they're, they're charging us for a bottle of water, it's like, bro, that's really not how this should work. <laughs> but, yeah, not at all. So, you know, anyways, but yeah, I just thought that was, I think that's like, it's cool that you guys are obviously are I mean, you don't get to be that successful without being on top of that kind of stuff, you know? Well, it's important to pay attention to that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, cause you know, we're in the, you know, we're, we're making friends too, you know, like we, we want, you know, we want to be part of musicians and artists lives and, and vice versa. You know, that's what we're, we're trying to do is and in, and in inevitably with the, you know, between the artists and the staff, and the fans, I mean, we're building community. You know, that's 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 part of it. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. 
Um, and speaking of community, uh, how active are you in kind of scoping out up and coming bands, local talent, and some of the, uh, you know, cities that are from, from the that you're pulling from? You know. Um, well, not you know since particularly since COVID, um, really my uh, I haven't been able to get out like I used to, um, and so uh, you know, and in the last bunch of years, I have people that I trust, um, you know, that I'll talk to. Um, but when I listen to music, um, but when we talk about local bands or regional bands, um, there's an element of me, you know, and my taste playing a role in it. But, um, to me, what's really important is if, if bands are out there working hard, consistently playing shows, doing what's necessary to, to be in the music industry, I'm going to work hard to try to give them a chance. Um, and hopefully that chance will help them, you know, um, to break me you know, to open other doors, you know, and then, and then they, once they get to the next stage, then I can book them from a different perspective. You know what I mean? It's so it's part scouting and going out, but it's also part paying attention to who's working hard. Right. You know, my taste is not everyone's taste. Um, and I recognize that and, you know, and I don't do a good enough job of it. You know, there's not enough slots to give everyone a chance. And that to me, that's the hardest part is, is is having to say no to people that have been working hard that haven't had a chance to come out to the park and play a show yet, you know, because I really want to give them a chance. They deserve it. I mean, if they're doing, if they're working hard, you know, if they're playing consistent gigs, if they're making records, if they're, you know, doing, doing those things that they need to, to be in the music industry. Totally. Of course we want to play, put out the best music as well, but, you know, of course, taste is subjective. Right, right. Um, and I'm curious, like, as far, like, um, when, like, how important is it to you, like, to see the social media, like, the activity on social media and, and just kind of, like, obviously, it's got to play some kind of role, right? Because that's kind of the, the outlet that most people are finding their music now. So to see people that are active and using the, the platforms properly must play some kind of a role. It, it does. Um, I remember, though, for there were times, right, that, we just get barraged by with messages by certain bands, six friends. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so you have to kind of like, it's important, but you got to look a little bit deeper into it, you know, cause some, some people are very visible and vocal and nobody's paying attention. Right. And then, but there's on the flip side, there's fan bases that, that, you know, that are very active. Um, and you can tell that there's a real ground swell and there's real, real fans and real support. Right. So you pay attention to that. So you have to be careful with social media. It's not, it's a great tool, but it's not, you know, you can't make all your decisions based on social media either. Right. You you have to do it. You know, I'm very much, I book on vibe. Um, a lot of the time, uh, you know, what feels like it makes sense where it, you know, what, what feels right. Um, and what will translate in, out into that forest, you know? Right. Um, but, but it's certainly one of, you know, it's a, you certainly, it certainly helps you to open your eyes to things that you wouldn't have known about necessarily. And sometimes it also confirms things that you already know. Right. Or are thinking. True. I was on the tail end of that. And I apologize about me in my, at 22 years old. <laughs> One of the coolest stories ever that Paul did. Uh, so Lucky Costello, uh, I think it was like our second, second year as a band. And we just hounded him. We just hounded you. Like, uh, uh, just sent emails as much I as we. 
I wasn't talking about Lucky Costello. Oh no, but yeah. we did it. I'm talking about Lucky Costello now yeah. <laughs> because that's what we fucking did. And uh, uh, the but the coolest fucking thing that ever happened is we were like, please can we play Bear Creek? Please, Paul, please, please, please. And then the, uh, uh, one night. Uh, 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 you came out with the uh, twenty. This poster right here, the twenty thirteen uh, or twenty, yeah, twenty thirteen Bear Creek, and uh, you didn't even you didn't even ask if like or it saved like what what we were going to be paid or any any, any crap like that, and he just put us on the festival <laughs> <Yeah>. lineup. <laughs> and my girlfriend at the time showed me that, and I I must have like I lost my shit. I was just screaming at the top of my lungs, but that was like the coolest thing ever. That I, the way that I found out I was playing a festival, That's <laughs> that Paul just put it on the fucking poster. So good. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that, and then also I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we did, and we practiced so hard for that set, and he gave us a amazing time slot 12 o'clock uh on a saturday <laughs> no i think it was like 11 o'clock on a saturday but so but like we were like just so happy that we did it and so we learned like a whole i think we played a, a star wars tribute set and we played like the four star wars songs in between like a hour long set but i can i can't thank you enough for that and it, it went a long way for for our band so thanks it's again <laughs> and then I think next year we're like, can we play again, please? <laughs> <laughs> but no more, no more. Damn, of that. damn it! I thought I, I, I mean, I thought I got, got you know, got, got got you off my back. No, but, I yeah. know. But like I said, I was I was young and stupid. I I, I think I was twenty. I was twenty two or twenty three. Or what was that? Yeah, that was ten years ago. So I've been like, yeah, twenty two. So what are you gonna um, do? You gotta learn the hard way. Great, you know when you, you know. Of course, you want to see that kind of enthusiasm, though. You know, I I always tell people that, um, you know, you you know this, Anton. You know, uh, persistence is important. You know, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I'm I'm very you know, surprised you know. as as how much you've responded to me over the years, and just uh, you know, whenever I even if I feel like I'm emailing you too much, you say, hey, you know, thanks for for touching base. You know. Keep keep at me a month from now or whatever. We'll we'll, we'll keep in touch. And just I've always re re really appreciated that about your approach. I, I've had people just ghost me or literally just be a complete asshole yeah. and blow me off. You know, so I've always appreciated that, you, that you've handled my persistence with uh, grace. You know. Well, I, I mean, look, it's you know, what we get to do is special. We, you know, I'm lucky to do what I do. I, you know, I feel it's an honor to be able to curate ta talent at music festivals, you know, and I take it really seriously and I take the people that want to be a part of it seriously. And, if, you know, if people are persistent and really stick to it, then, you know, that means a lot to me, you know? And so it's not, it's not a bother, you know, it, the, the only thing that I don't like about it is when I have to say no. And then that's, that's, the part that makes me uncomfortable. Right. You know, um, because, because I can feel the passion, you know, and, 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 and I appreciate that. For sure. Um, and definitely translates when, when, when people are working with you for sure. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm curious, like, do you have any, are there kind of, are there red flags that you look out for when bands are reaching out to you or, um, even after you've booked them or, like, and then you see like certain things that are kind of going on where like, ah, I don't think this is going to work out again or, you know, whatever. I mean, bad be, you know, there's certain bad behavior, um, you know, that can, it can contribute to that, you know, things that people, um, do at your festival or at others or, you know, or in their, in their lives. It doesn't happen very often, but occasionally, um, you, you know, you get a vibe or you hear about, um, you don't want to have toxic situations. Right. Um, and so sometimes, you know, on very rare occasion, you have to, you make some decisions, even, even in, about your friends that, you know, it's not the right time to bring somebody into this for whatever reason. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to protect your artists. You want to protect your art, your audience, you know, and sometimes people are at a point in their life where they're not ready to be out there on your stage. Yeah. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah. 
And what about, uh, this is one of my favorite questions to ask anybody, honestly, the uh, pet peeves <laughs> when you were working with, uh, whether it be staff or bands or, you know, artist representation, whoever it might be, uh, just things that, that really just rub you the wrong way. Um, eh, it's usually stuff with the agents. agents yeah. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, do you prefer working with representation or would you rather speak to the bands directly? Um, well, uh, you know, there's just different, it depends. It depends who it is. Yeah. Uh, some, I mean, I love dealing with bands, but when you deal with creative people, sometimes some of the details are missed. Yeah. Right? And so that's why people have representation. Um, um, you know, some, some agents, you know, can kind of spin things a certain way or try to back you into a corner say you said this or this you promised this or you know this is where my artist you know i mean that the biggest thing i hate in the industry is the ego of agents and management sometimes about where there's to be on a poster yeah you know, like a, <laughs> right uh, you know and it's like it's like I'm curating this festival. I know where you are on my lineup and I know why I booked you. So go fuck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about that where artists, there was a documentary I was watching where somebody, I think it was a, uh, whoever, somebody was designing the poster and then was showing the, uh, was just kind of running it by everybody. And then one of the artists was complaining because their name was too small or like not high enough up on the bill and they had to redo the whole thing. It was a whole controversy. Does that happen often? You wouldn't believe how often, like the Halloween lineup is a nightmare. Oh my God. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of that in the electronic music world. It's, it's incredible. It's just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. And, and, and not just in the electronic music world, but there's a lot of that there. Just, and what it is is that, you know, the agents are working hard to help their act to, to elevate, but they're going, you know, they're having to push up their chest and prove something to their artist, you know what I mean, by right. holding line, the line, you know, or else they don't, or they think the artist doesn't think they're doing their job properly. Right, that so, makes total sense, yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, that, that is probably the most annoying part of, of the business at this point. It's just, it, it's, Michael Berg handles more of the electronic music and that <laughs> side of things. So, you know, he's a, he's a, he's an angel and a master at it. Yeah. That's a, that's definitely a particular skill. I've always been kind of, uh, curious as to what, um, kind of, where the desire to, to work in, in like the kind of auxiliary sides of the, of the music industry, because I, I know what we get out of it, right? All the bullshit that we have to put up with and all the, all the, like, I, I know what we get out of it, but what do like agents and managers that are taking, you know, percentages of, of gross or whatever on, on, on a lot of things. It's like, there's a lot of other industries that you could be taking percentages off of that would make you a lot more money. Where's the satisfaction coming with all the bullshit you got to deal with from, for, right. you know, dealing with in, in the music industry. You know what I mean? It takes yeah. a special kind of person. A lot of patience. Yeah, for sure. They get free festival tickets. What do you mean? That's why they're free in it. Yeah. Tickets, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man, it's, it's just, it's wild to me. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, any, uh, any advice for uh, up and coming bands or promoters or anything that, that you think, uh, you know, kind of would help save some, some heartache and money loss for people? I, I, you know, ask, well, get, ex get, get, get enough experience. Um, you know, if, if you don't know anybody in the business and you want to work in the business, go volunteer. That's how you, how you get, get your foot in the door. You, you, you know, that's how you meet people. And then, and then the next year you can get a job. You know, if, if you prove, if you show something to somebody, you know, um, and, and then once once you're in it or if you want to start putting on shows 
you know, find somebody that knows more than you and seek their advice, hire them if you can and, you know, help them or they can help you to have your vision come out. Um, you know, you don't have to listen to everything they say, but at least they'll have, have, you know, gone down that road that you're going down and be able to, you know, share some wisdom that, you know, inevitably will, will save you money in the long run. Totally. I mean, for fans, you know, it's, um, it's get out there and work hard, play shows. You know, I know it's harder right now, but if you're a local band, get out of your town. Don't play too many shows in your town. You know, have a bait, have that base. But if, if it's, if your base is all that you have, then, you know, then it's harder to take the next step. So you need to, you need, you need to, to fi- figure out a way to expand your base beyond where you are. And you don't have to grow too fast, but don't, you know, bands, big, local bands that play 20, 20 shows a year in the local market are probably playing it too much. Yeah, for you sure. I mean, and, um, if, if their goal is to, you know, I mean, look, there's no exact formula, right? Maybe. And that works for some people. People have a, every week gig and that can work too, but got to get outside of, you know, your comfort zone, I guess. Yeah. You know, and, and play those shows. And sometimes it's going to be empty rooms, and, but you got to make fans, you know, one at a time, you know, and, and it's the small shows sometimes that, you know, that that's what that's the step to the to the big to a bigger show. You know, it's also where you can and, make some of the some of your best fans because they will have seen you in that really intimate kind of setting. And then they feel like they got a special thing there. Um, and then they kind of incentivize them to come back and watch you grow into the to the bigger shows, you know. Absolutely. You know, and if 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 you if a band is playing to a small audience and you know, is feeling sorry for themselves and plays a shit show. Well, those people aren't going to come back. Totally. If you play your, if you play your show and you move them, then they're going to tell people. And, and the next time you come, there's going to be a lot of people in that room. Right. You know how it works. You know, I think a lot of people these days just want an instant success. And that's not, that's not what rock and roll is all about. Totally, man. I mean, occasionally, I guess somebody gets, lucky on tiktok (laughs) there's there's always gonna be outliers but it's never the uh it's never the the the, you know the rule you know so yeah yeah a thousand percent um and uh just i I only have like one more question i'm I'm always curious about this question from uh from your guys's perspective because you know the 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 argument that you hear a lot with uh bands uh specifically people that are typically in the cover band scene because they, they don't have a real good grasp on what the music industry actually looks like. So the idea of like exposure gigs and uh, getting paid to play type thing, um, I'm of the mindset that I think there are such a thing as exposure gigs. And then if you're a band writing music and trying to create your own brand, that it's actually a very necessary part of growing your, your, your brand. Um, you know, I don't think that you, that just because you play an instrument entitles you to any kind of compensation. If you haven't proven that you're worth anything, you know, monetarily anyways. Well, if you're trying to become a, a national act, you know, if you're trying to grow in that way, you need to get to play music in front of certain people. You need to do that. I mean, and some of those people are promoters. Some of those people are fans, you know, so you need to expose your music to as many people as you can. Um, and that's how you, you know, look, talking about people that are playing a lot of shows in their hometown well if you're doing just that well yeah you should be getting paid right because those people know you totally but if you're me- making new friends if you're making new friends sometimes you do have to take you know take what you can get or you know or, or what have you i'm sure with lucky costello we probably gave you tickets yep for you know <laughs> i wasn't gonna say it though huh i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna talk about our deal <laughs> that's the way to well, do it <laughs> well i mean well, but we always tried to be cool about it and like, 
you know, we'd give, we'd give bands that we normally would have probably paid 500 bucks. We give them a thousand dollars worth of tickets. Oh yeah. You know, they could, you know, so they could do better than I would have been able to pay them. Especially at um, a festival like that but, where those tickets sell themselves, you know? But you know, they don't always, you know? So sometimes, you know, if you have a shitty show and you do it like that and they don't get paid anything, well, that sucks. But right. anyway, um, we don't, we don't do that anymore. We've moved away from it. <laughs> he wants to. He wants to chime in. He's got a lot yeah, to say on the subject. Yeah. <laughs> She's barking her approval. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, um, you know. Yeah. As you're growing and developing, it you have to. You're right. There are some gigs that are for exposure. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Like you all come into play. You know, hula. You know, we're gonna, pay, we're gonna pay you something, but you probably get paid more when you play a gig in Jacksonville. And well, you, hopefully, you're gonna make you know 500 new fans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you're gonna be able to, you know, tell whatever festival in North Carolina. Well, I played Halloween, and you know that means something to that to promoters. Yeah. 100%. So there's value. There's different. There's different kinds of value. Yeah, hundred percent. It's all risk reward thing. Yeah, it's just a, a lot of people. I feel like just attach value to only the money side of it and don't see the value in anything else. That's the kind of shit that gets you stuck playing cover gigs in your town for the rest of your life. You know, or don't or don't do anything with the fact that you just played Halloween or yeah. Bear Creek or or anywhere at Swanee, and, and that's that's where you're just like, dude, like Paul gave you this fucking chance, and then he wants to see you grow, and you're like, what are you doing with it? Exactly. So. Exactly. Uh, Bill, you got any last questions you want to ask? Uh, yeah. Uh, How did you get involved? Or I don't know if it was you or your partner. Uh, get involved with Frank Moody. Frank Moody? Yeah. They're my new favorite band. I love um, them. And I, I, I saw that they I, were on Hulu. Uh, it, it, um, Ian Wallach uh, is a great guy and a music fan who's a huge fan. And he turned on my friend Dean Parsons, who lives in Jacksonville. And so they started telling me that we should check out Frank Moody and you know I'm a funk junkie so as soon as I started hearing it um you know it was uh it was on you know we were determined to get him hula they canceled on us last year because of they couldn't because of COVID and travel problems and so they played rising this year it was amazing and now they're gonna play in a, you know a ridiculous um stage closing slot on the Spirit Lake stage at Halloween this year, and it's going to be insane. That's so, have you listened to them yet, Anton? Uh, I don't think so. They are ridiculous. I, they're my new favorite band for sure. Really? Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was like a DJ at first, and then I was like, this the bass sounds really organic and real. Like, I, how are they getting that tone? And then I watched like a video of them, and it's like a full band. I'm like, oh my god, he plays clarinet during like uh, uh, one of his tracks. It's amazing. Really? Like, and it's all like dance music, but he's like playing like a clarinet. It's awesome. That sounds dope. So Let's yeah, I'm really excited sure. to, to see him. Hell yeah. Um, are right, you guys want to do some unpopular opinions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, that might, I might have to, I'm going to have to uh, move locations because my computer battery um, is about to die. So. Okay. <laughs> plug in. Um, so we go from outside to the kitchen. Nice. <laughs> We're changing the set real quick. Yeah. Run. Really? I still don't know if I should do my unpopular opinion from last week that I was saving or a new one that I got. Whatever you're feeling, bro. It's whatever you're feeling. I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be really embarrassed if I say the one that I, I th- I'm gonna go with that. Go with it, yeah. And I, I know it's gonna like piss off everybody in the room. Try and get some fucking views here. Or maybe you, know you I mean? won't. Try to sell tickets, kid. Try to sell tickets. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's where I came up with the bottom of the bill idea, though, is because that of that poster. It's like like you got solo at the very very bottom. <laughs> yeah, we have to talk about who came up with that idea. I'm pretty sure that we were don't, talking about this in the van on don't, tour one time, and I'm pretty sure that, that I'm, I'm the one that up. came up with it. But it's okay. No, like no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyways, uh, what's your unpopular opinion, Bill? All right, I'll go for it. So, uh, unpopular opinion is uh, "Hey Jude" is the best Beatles song. Is their best song. Hmm. <laughs> and I was saving that from last week. Right, it's you, a great wait, song. You think it is or it isn't? It is. It's their best song. And I was checking Spotify today, and it's not even their top five. Do you know what their number one played song is? Well, it's not on any of their records. Okay. 
cool. Yes, it is. Hey Jude is. Hey Jude is on there. It's uh, a single. It was released as a single. No, it's not a single. It's on a record uh, that was uh, yeah. pretty. It was. It was a record that after the Beatles broke up. But Hey Jude is on that rec. That record. Hmm. Okay. But I have it if you want to look at it later. Okay. But uh, uh, there. You know what the number one song is? What? On most streams. What? Is uh, uh uh oh my gosh, here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. That's yeah. a good one. Cause it's played at all the weddings. I think is why. Yeah. I don't know. But anyways, it's, it's, I think it's the best song. Best song. It is their best song. Yep. I mean, it's a damn good song. It's uh, here's why is because like uh uh obviously like the beginning of it like a lot of people know the words for it but it doesn't matter what language. You speak. You can sing the na 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 part. Yeah. And it's just like the most universal. It was genius. The, the history of that song is hilarious. I don't know if it's true or not. Just a rumor about how they were like uh, uh, trying to, or uh, Paul McCartney was like, bet, like make a song with a hit chorus with no words. And he was like, done. I thought he wrote that song for John Lennon's son. He did, but John like Lennon. the chorus or whatever. Oh, like, okay. and, and put that in. Yeah. yeah I, that That is true that he I wrote mean, it for a song. I don't know that that's an unpopular opinion. I think. You're not the only one that thinks that. All right. Yeah. That's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great song. It's probably not my favorite one by them, but I don't, I mean, I, I love it. It's that not song. my favorite. It's just their best song. It's, oh, you're saying it's just objectively their best song. Yeah, because anybody in the world can sing it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, interesting. And I think more people should, should do that. I think that's why Mumble Rap caught on. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody can sing it. Yeah. Okay. That was interesting. a dumb take. <laughs> all um, right. What do you got? All right. Well, my unpopular opinion is that uh, Rumple Mints is not good. Oh my god! Yeah, I hundred percent agree with you. It's like the worst thing on the planet. Yeah, it t- it's like you're drinking mouthwash. It's only people who are bartenders drink rumble mints. Yeah, what is this thing? Do you, do you, you, are you? It gets bar- you fucked up fast. It's the same yeah, alcohol it content. It's, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, it's hundred. Actually, it's actually a good mixer. It's a good mixer. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be for. But people you drink can, shots of it, it at the end of the night. Uh, you can make you can make good shots with it. If you like those kind of you know, minty, chocolatey kind of weird shots. It wouldn't bother Girl me. Scout, if, Girl, Girl Scout cookies and, <laughs> you know, whatever the kind of things are. Right. You know? It wouldn't bother me so much if it was mixed, but people are just drinking them straight up, like taking shots of rumpies straight up, and I'm just don't understand. Like Chris back over there is all into that stuff. I've seen it. I've seen it like every single time we play a, a bar and uh, we play till close, till one thirty, and they kick everybody out the entire Bartending crew all takes a shot of rumple mints. Also, the Monday Night Funk Jam at 1904 loves their rumpies. Don't I was they? gonna say we're pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm. A, I'll bring out you know at the end of your set we'll we'll uh, we'll 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 down a rumple mints. There you go. No thanks. <laughs> I'll pass it's a hard pass for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got when in Rome. I would do it if everybody else is doing it, but like, ugh. Not willingly. I had someone <laughs> buy me a shot the other night, and they were like, uh, rumpies, and I was like, fuck no. Rumpies? Yeah. <laughs> you buy rumpies. me something else, bro. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy that like rejects a free shot, but if you're going to pay for it, I'll tell you what I want. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what about you, Paul? What's your unpopular opinion? Um, I had one, too. I had, I had an unpopular opinion. Yeah, what you got? Um, I'd rather go see a band play original music than covers. You know, that's, that is actually a great unpopular opinion, and it's just sad that that's an unpopular opinion. Yep, it's very, especially in Jacksonville Beach. I mean, like, nobody uh, gives a fuck about your original music. They want to hear Sublime or Red Hot Chili Peppers. Or Wagon and then, Wheel. And then, Sublime, and then Wagon Wheel. Yeah. But mostly Sublime. Yeah. Sublime. Yeah. Do you know Santeria? Yeah, you start playing Under the Bridge. <laughs> Isn't Wagon Wheel? You have to, it's a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, Wagon Wheel and then Freebird is a little bit more expensive now. Fucking with Anton's cheap ass. And Mustang Sally. Oh, Mustang Sally. I've on purpose never learned that one. Yeah, me either. I never, I've never had to play it. I played it one time in a blues band that I used to be in, but like I didn't, I never learned it like as part of a regular set set list thing. So I don't know it, and people request it. I don't play. I don't play Sweet Caroline. I don't play. <laughs> fuck it, I don't play any of the hits that people want to hear. Take that shit somewhere else. You'll find that shit with anybody else in town. Yeah. You know? And that's why we're doing so great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we play we play the B-sides of your favorite bands that no one's ever heard of. That's true. Yeah, it's true. And then whatever. But we still get paid. Yeah. We just jam. We're good at jamming. Yeah. But, you know, this is what it, you got to keep it interesting for yourself, right? If you're going to play covers and shit, make money. Unfortunately, you know, Side Hustle is an original band, so we don't play the bars, but we do have a cover band that plays bars around town to, to you know, help pay for everything. And, uh, you know, 
you do that shit all like every night of the week and you have to like, keep it interesting you have to you know jam or like you know do tunes that you like that people might know but also you know may, might not know by artists that keep they it like, interesting you know? to you but not to the audience who's paying you uh, <laughs> the bar's paying me so yeah well yeah of course yeah but but yeah, I feel that man. I wish it's that very wasn't. unpopular. Yeah. <laughs> but to musicians, that's very popular. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, Paul, man, thank you again for being here. Really appreciate you taking the time. It's been great, kind of getting to talk to you and know you on a different level, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, man, can't wait to see you soon, dude, in person. But thanks so much for giving us a call. See you at the park this fall. Yeah, hell yeah. All right, man. Have, have a good one. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. Adios, muchachos.